Don't you wanna be a king? Don't you wanna be a king? Come on, come on, everybody. Jesus is a winner, man. Jesus, winner, man. Jesus is a winner, man. Chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread, that these may eat? And this he said to prove him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea, and entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, 
not because he saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time 
many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. May God bless his word in our heart in Jesus' name. Please do not forget to give my sister the visitor um, note to fill so that we have his ad our address with us. Uh, also, let us continue to keep praying for us. To me, it's like she should not go back. Trust me. Uh, and about the grace of the Lord, we retain her in Jesus' name. <laughs> So there's something I'm looking at. Sometimes it's we are family, and then um, we can continue to get to each other. And the way we can retain people is this: in case we ask some people that they want to take care of their children, and then we are looking for somebody to stay with them. I think she will, she is in good position to do that. And then I think if we can see a, a promotion in job like that, God will retain her in child love. God will retain her in child love in Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we shall listen to Koya Son.
again will be my loss if I lay down commitment trust. So I lift my eyes to things above, serving with a heart of The cross is all big pacify from heart about to break inside. Then Jesus showed himself to me and said, Just look what you could be.
awake i said praise the lord this is my first time of seeing you this year happy new year prosperous new year and blessed new year in jesus name things will be better for you this year forward ever backward never all the prayers of the past years will be all bottled together and poured upon you this year in Jesus' name. Somebody help me shout showers. Showers of blessing. Upon your life. Upon your wives. That amen is too long. Upon your husbands. Upon your children. And upon your ministry in the Lord in Jesus' name, you will succeed. Give me another amen. amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your people. We're asking, Lord, that this year will be a year of victory, a year of blessing, a year of progress. Touch every life, Lord, and make us channels of blessings in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to the word of God. Thank you. You can sit down. Welcome to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 22. 1 John chapter 3 verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we we'll receive of him. Because we keep his commandments, listen to this, and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. It talks to us about what affects our lives, what affects our prayer life, what affects what we receive from the Lord. It says, as we pray, as we ask, as we demand of the Lord, here is the confidence we have that he gives us all the things we are asking because we do those things which are pleasing in his sight. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. You have received of us. You have received messages. You received ministrations. And everything is pointing to the fact that you ought to walk and to please the Lord. So do ye, so ye would abound more and more. And I pray that our lives will abound to please the Lord this year in Jesus' name. An acceptable and approved and appreciated life is a life that pleases God in all things and at all times. Pleasing God completely. Pleasing God entirely. Pleasing God wholeheartedly. Pleasing God fully. Pleasing God in all respects and from the first to the last without wavering in every situation that's God's delight. This is the expressed reason why God chose, why God called, and why God appointed a man like David. When he saw what Saul had done, he said, I'm looking for another man. Another man that will please the Lord. Another man that will fulfill all the desires of the Lord. We're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 22. Acts chapter 13, reading from verse 22. It says, when he had removed him, removed Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David. It's like he's been searching. He's searched in the west, in the east, in the north, in the south of the country. He's been seeking everywhere. In every city, every major city, and every little hamlet. And then he said, I found him. I found him. I've been looking, looking for a man. A man that will do my will. A man that will walk after all my will. Then he said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill 
all my will. And so anyone, David or Solomon or Elijah or Daniel or Shedah, Peshach, Abednego, or is John the Baptist or Peter, Paul, anyone, the Lord wants us to live the life, the life that pleases him. And when he finds you, and you come into the kingdom, his joy, his delight is, I found him, I found her, a man, a woman, that will do my will, fulfill all my will, to turn aside and to please the flesh, to turn aside and to please the world, to turn aside and to please the devil, to turn aside and to please self, or to please the strangers and please foreign nations, or to please tradition, or to please the family, or to please your tribe, or to please and surrender to your persecutors, or to please the enemies. Turning aside like that displeases the Lord. And David pleased the flesh. And so displeased the Lord. And he suffered greatly. We're coming to Second Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. I'm reading the last line of the last verse. Second Samuel chapter 11. Reading the last line and the last of the last verse. Second Samuel chapter 11. Last line. But the sin that David, David had done displeased the Lord. That punctuation mark in the life of a man that God had boasted about, that God had presented to the angels, that God had presented to the world. I found a man. I've been searching. At last, I found him. He's a man that will fulfill all my will and then to have the comment about his life. But, I've been saying this, this, and this about him, but, I've noticed this and this about him, but, I look at his courage, I look at his faith, I look at his confidence, I look at his life, I look at his running the errand, I look at his wisdom, I look at his availability, I look at his faithfulness, I look at his psalms, I look at his singing, I look at everything, delightful. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7. And God was displeased with this thing because this, therefore he smote Israel. He's still talking about David at another time. And to think that this is the late hour, the late period of his life, that he had been pleasing the Lord. And now it says, and God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel in verse 8. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this sin. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant for I have done very foolishly and these things are written for learning so that we will be careful cautious in our lives that we do the things that are pleasing unto the Lord in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 10 reading from verse 6 1 Corinthians 10 reading from verse 5 and with many of them God was not well pleased watching their lives watching their actions watching their behavior watching their conduct watching their response to the word he gave them watching their reactions it says and with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things were for our, for our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. We're not to keep their lives as examples or models or to follow after. 
It says, the reaching for learning, for admonition, so that we will not do as they have done. We're looking at the message, the absolutely essential ministry of pleasing the Lord. Every time, always, in every place, in all situations, alone, with other people, in the village, in the town, in the church, in the office, in the marketplace, the absolutely essential ministry of pleasing the Lord. There are three points we're looking at. Number one, the backsliders' great misery, misery after displeasing the Lord. The backsliders' great misery after displeasing the Lord. Number two, the blessed gospel model of pleasing the Lord. Thank God we have a model, a model greater than that of David. Gospel model, the blessed gospel model of pleasing the Lord. Number three, the believer's gracious ministry that pleases the Lord. The believer's gracious ministry that pleases the Lord. Number one, the backslider's great misery after displeasing the Lord. I'm coming back to that verse of scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 27. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27, the last part. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And because of that, judgment came upon him and upon his family and upon the people that were accomplices that supported him that associated with him that helped him in doing that evil thing and in first chronicles chapter 12 first chronicles rather chapter 21 first chronicles chapter 21 i'm reading here from verse 1 and satan stood up against israel and provoked David to number Israel. Judah should watch every action, every pronouncement, every step, every move. Fathers should watch every action, every move, every pronouncement. Mothers should watch every action, every move, every pronouncement, everything you do to ask is this of the Holy Spirit or is this of the human spirit? Or is this of the satanic plan and intention that he wants to ruin you and he wants to ruin your family? Since he stood up against Israel and he provoked David to number Israel. And that's what we have in verse 7. That God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly. We shall think before we act. We shall think of what's going to be the result of our action. Or what's going to be God's response to our action. Verse 9. And the Lord spake unto God, David seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So God came to David and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, choose thee. There are people, after they are born again, after the children of God, they become carefree. They do not understand, they do not know that Satan is after them. He wants to destroy them. And so whatever they want to do, they just do they do not know that this action or this pushing or this impulse is coming from the devil. And the devil has an intention. And in that in the case of David, he never knew. He thought, I'm the king, I'm in authority, I command this to be done, and it's done. Do you check the comments you give out, the instructions you give out, man of authority, woman of authority, the actions you take. The lines you follow, the decisions you follow, and the things you do, is this coming from God 
If so, it will be blessed. Is this coming from the devil? If so, the consequences are going to be serious, deadly, destructive. Or is it coming from the human flesh? Think about that. Either three years for me, make a choice. Or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, thine enemies, while that the sword of thine enemies overtake thee. Or else three days, the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. Now therefore, advise thyself, watch, watch. I shall bring again to him that sent me. Just by doing what displeased the Lord. Look at what happened to him. And look at what happened to the nation. Verse 14. So the Lord sent pestilence among Israel. And there fell of Israel. How many? 70,000 men. By doing what displeased the Lord, the consequence was upon him as well as upon the nation. And that's what backsliders do every day of their lives. They do things that displease the Lord. They may come to church. In the church, they do things displeasing to the Lord. They may seem to say with their families. Even within the family circle, they do things displeasing to the Lord. They might have some work they're doing. And in the place of work, continually they do things that are displeasing you know, unto the Lord. And the consequences are always there. Psalm 60 verse 1. Psalm 60, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, So God, that was cast us off, and that was scattered us, thou hast been displeased, who turn thyself to us again. God was displeased with them. Look at verse 3. It says, Thou hast showed thy people hard things, hard things. The way of the transgressor is hard. And when you displease the Lord, everything goes up, upside down. Life, family, work, profession, what you touch, every tur everything turns to misery. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, reading from verse 14. Isaiah 59, verse 14. And judgment is turned away backward. And justice standeth afar off. For truth is falling in the streets. Where the children of God don't take the truth to the streets. We have the truth in the church. We abide with the truth in the church. We accept the truth in the church. The truth that saves. The truth that sanctifies. The truth that changes life. The truth that transforms our lives. We hold that in the church. We get to the streets and the truth is falling. And then it says, equity cannot enter. Yea, truth falleth. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it. And it displeased him. When the truth of salvation falls, and we're not standing by that, that displeases the Lord. When the truth of holiness, transparent holiness falls, and we're not standing by that, that displeases the Lord. When the truth of sanctification, a purified heart, a circumcised heart falls, and in the offices there's no holiness, there's no sanctification, that displeases the Lord. It displeased him that there was no justice and no righteousness and no judgment. We're looking at Hosea chapter 8. Hosea chapter 8. Reading from verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. When God says, I don't have pleasure in him. I don't have pleasure in her. I don't have pleasure in them. That means he's displeased with them. And in the case of Israel, what well, was we'll he displeased with them? And understand, God remains the same. Whatever displeased him at that time, 
displeases him today. Whatever made Israel to be of no pleasure unto the Lord at that time makes you and makes me and makes any group of people of no pleasure to the Lord even at this time. What made him to be displeased with them? Hosea chapter 8 verse 3. Israel has cast off the sinner that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. Israel has cast off the thing that is good, the teaching he gave them, the doctrine he gave them, the life he gave them to live, and the precepts he gave them to live, Israel cast that off, want to be like other nations, and do what other nations are doing, and it says the enemy shall pursue him, look at verse 12 I have written to him that's the word of God, I have written to him that's the covenant of God. I've written to him. That's the teaching of the Bible. I've written to him. That's the doctrine of the word. The doctrine that comes to change life. I've written unto him the great things of my law. But they were counted as a strange thing. That displeases the Lord. David displeased the Lord. Though he remained on the throne, he was deprived of fellowship and favor with God. Nathan the prophet was sent to him. David judged the supposed guilty man. The prophet preacher confronted him and brought him to conviction. He repented. But he wasn't the only one that near repentance. The repentance must go around. Bathsheba needed repentance. If you read the passage carefully, he said, and Bathsheba came willingly. It wasn't forced on her. She came willingly to make the king fall. She came willingly to destroy husband. She came willingly to cause the assassination of a faithful husband. She destroyed herself in destroying husband. She needed repentance too. Joab needed repentance. Joab should have questioned, hey, what's happening here? When I killed Abner, David put a curse on me and he announced to the whole nation that his son is not here and he mourned grievously. And then he said, this blood will never depart from the house of Joab. And now the same king is sending to me that shall help him finish this man. What's happening here? Joab also was guilty. He needed repentance. The messengers of David who assisted him, who gave him all the information, and who was the link between him and the sin partner, he needed repentance too. Without repentance, where will they spend eternity? Where is Joab now? Where are those servants now? Where is Bathsheba? Well, maybe you know, but I don't know. All those people that committed sin and they did not repent, where are they? Where will they spend eternity? Where will you spend eternity? If you're living in sin, if you're backsliding, if you're displeasing to the Lord, and yet activities go on as usual, church work goes on as usual, ministry goes on as usual, and yet there is sin or repented of. Listen, if you committed sin, even if you stopped committing that sin, but you have not confessed, you have not gone to Calvary, you have not been cleansed, and you have not been shown the clear way that everything is now all right, and then you just carry on business as usual, you are not free. We're talking about getting to heaven. We're talking about pleasing the Lord. It displeased the Lord. And don't you see the faithfulness of God? The Lord forgave David, but he didn't sweep it under the carpet. He wrote it in the Bible. His man committed sin. He wrote it in the Bible. His favorite, if God has any favorite, committed sin, and he wrote it in the Bible. He said, yes, you are forgiven, but he still wrote it in the Bible. For all the generations coming to know, the Lord was not dealing with it uh, privately. And uh, even uh, David himself, the Psalms he wrote. 
at this time when we're seeking the face of the Lord it is the have I committed this thing and the only that is also written in the word of God deliver your servant from blood guiltiness that is also written in the Bible in Psalm 51 so God is no respecter of persons and there is great mystery for the people that go on in sin the people that live in sin and they will not repent especially when they sin against the truth against the light when they know to do better and they still do evil in Zechariah chapter 1 reading from verse 2 Zechariah chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 2 it says the Lord has been so displeased with your fathers therefore say thou unto them thus says the Lord of hosts to me unto me says the Lord of hosts and I will turn unto you says the Lord of hosts be not as your fathers that is if your fathers have disappointed the Lord and they have displeased the Lord you'll not say daddy did it I will do it mommy did it like that I must do it my senior sister did it like that I must do it like this it says no be ye not like as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried saying thus says the lord of hosts turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings but they did not hear nor hearken unto me says the lord look at the result of that the repercussion of that the first part of verse 15 says even for the gentiles and I'm very so displeased with the heathen that are at ease. The people that are breaking the commandments of Lord are they still at ease. The people that are going the wrong way are they still at ease. The people that do the old tricks in the new year are they still at ease. The people that remain rebellious in the new year, when God is saying there's a new chance here, there's a good opportunity here, let the old things pass away, let all things become new, and they still do the old life, and they are still at ease, and it displease the Lord. I pray we'll not keep on displeasing the Lord. The church will say amen. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 5. It tells us in verse 5, Romans chapter 8, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. For they that are in the flesh, tell me, tell me out loud, say that once again. Those who are not born again, they may make resolutions and try and try, they cannot please God. Those who are backsliding, and they have not recovered the grace of God back into their lives. No way, they cannot please the Lord. Those who are carnal. And then that penalty has not been broken by Calvary, by the cross. They cannot please the Lord. The people that have their flesh more pronounced than their spirit, and their flesh talks, and their flesh, they, their flesh whispers, and their flesh shouts, and their flesh screams, saying, this is what to do. And their spirit is so weak, the flesh cannot take precedence over the flesh. They that are after the flesh cannot please God. That means judgment comes upon them. But when you turn, you repent, you live by faith, and faith subdues the flesh. And faith lives victoriously after the flesh. Then judgment will vanish away. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, that's just it's possible to draw back after salvation, saved by grace, through faith. 
is still possible to draw back sanctified, made holy, made free from sin by the power of Christ at Calvary, by faith. It's still possible to draw back. That's why it says, But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. For those who draw back, God is displeased. You've been in righteousness, you draw back to unrighteousness, God is displeased. You've been preaching forcefully, preaching the word of God. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Now, you still preach, but you, you manage to preach and even if you mention holiness everybody knows it's superficial it's not from your heart if any man draws back my soul shall have no pleasure in him you've been preaching one man one wife until death do us, do us part and if anybody commits adultery that's a sin you are backsliding but now you say if anybody commits adultery uh, well don't stay there uh, God is uh, kind God is wonderful you don't stress conviction anymore you are not stressing repentance anymore you are not stressing restitution anymore you gloss over things and if you're right you're right in such a way as to let go the people that are living in sin if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him if before if you get the word that is firm and the word that is a preach convincingly that sin is sin. If anybody is born again, he will not continue sin. Your heart will say, praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, that's the word. But if you hear that word today, you feel a kind of discomfort. You feel, are they up to that again? You feel as if that again? And you feel, well, when are we going to go to another subject? When are we going to go to another thing? It means you've drawn back. Your mind is no more that holiness, no more that righteousness, and no more that faithfulness that pleases the Lord. If any man draw back, if any woman draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of the good drawback unto perdition. You may go to amen there. Those who draw back, where do they draw back to? If they draw back from faith, where do they draw back to? If they draw back from righteousness, where do they draw back to? If they draw back away from holiness and sanctification, where did they draw back to? If they draw back from one man, one wife, until death lost path, where did they draw back to? Tell me out loud. And you and you say God's work. They use God's work to abandon their family, to let the woman go. And some of us too who are leaders and we are appointing people to go to this place and to go to that place. We send the man away for maybe about uh, one year to stay there. We don't know what's happening to him. We don't care what happens to him. We are just in a committee and the committee has decided this man should leave his wife and leave his children and be transported to a particular place far away. He's doing the work of God. Work of God. Are we going to use the work of God to destroy the family? The wife is here. The wife does not know what's happening to the husband. And the husband too is managing himself. I hope he's not managing himself with sin. Not manage himself with you know the people over there. I hope we're still doing the work of God and still keeping the family together. We're doing the work of God and we're still keeping the family as a whole family integrated together, united together. Uh, to let you know if, if we have the people who are working with us on full time and then their husbands are you know far away like that if it comes too long we might have to call the wife and say what is your husband what's happening to your family what's happening to you everything is okay no way you, you think like that we don't think like that might ask you to either have your husband come back or your wife go and join you and if you are not in our employment yet and you say i'm qualified i have this qualification that qualification and then you know i want to apply i want to serve here i want to serve there and we say where is your husband ah my husband has been I don't know what's happening to him. He's been away for about three years. I don't know. In fact, we just communicate on phone. We cannot employ such a person because you understand. We need to. Be, we're not just a giving job here, giving job here. We want to keep to the word of God. We'll keep to the word of God in Jesus' name. And we who are leaders will try to show you by example. But some people don't pick up the example. They just feel okay. That's what the pastor does. That's what the GS does. But me, this is what. I will do. 
it should be the same standard and the same doctrine, the same word of God. And we're going to keep that word in Jesus' name. If the church dares to hear what they are, Pastor. It says in verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Point number two, the blessed gospel model of pleasing the Lord. If we're looking for a life that pleases the Lord, Jesus Christ himself, our Savior, our Lord, he lived such a life and did everything that the Father in heaven said, this is my beloved son who has pleased me well. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3 verse 17. Matthew chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 17 and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. That God could think about you like that, could talk about you like that. This is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Because the Lord Jesus Christ totally committed himself to pleasing God the Father. He was faithful every moment. He was faithful every day. His mind was set on pleasing the Father. At the time of temptation, he pleased the Father. At the time of preaching, he pleased the Father. At the time of ministry, he pleased the Father. At the time of persecution, he pleased the Father. At the time of humiliation, he pleased the Father. At the time of recognition and exaltation, he pleased the Father. At the time of conspiracy, at the time of opposition, at the time of rejection, at the time of suffering, at the time of betrayal, at the time of crucifixion, in fact, until death, he pleased the Father. And then that's the life the Lord has called us to. That whatever it is and whenever it is will please the Father. And the grace to do that, he'll give to you and give to me and give to us all in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 18. This blessed, great gospel model of pleasing God, of pleasing the Lord. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, it says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. It was pleased in him all the time. We're looking at chapter 17, verse 5. Chapter 17, we're looking at verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, the voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased hear ye him. And so you find three testimonies in Matthew alone at different times how the Father said that Christ, our Lord, our Savior, pleased him. How? What made the Father to say that? What was in his life? That should be in your life and in my life that will make him to say that about me, about you, about us all. In John chapter 6, John chapter 6, we're reading from verse 38. John chapter 6. We're reading from verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. Does your will conflict or compete with the will of God? Or do you say, I came here to do the will of God? I came into the church not to do my own will. But to do the will of him that saved me. I'm in the service of the Lord. Not to do my will. But to do the will of him that appointed me. I am in the family. I'm married. And I'm not here to lord it over the woman. And to have a slave there. I'm not here to do my will. The human will wants to have a slave. And did you read of, uh, you know, the man that, you know, will tie whatever rope like a dog on ladies and be pulling them along the street? And then there are people that say, why should you oppose him? You know, that's this man. He is free. He is free to, you know, make uh, slaves of women. I don't know people that do that in their home. Sometimes you hear people that, you know, lock the door and then they go out. And then the woman is there inside until they come back. I hope that doesn't happen in your family. Ah. I pray it will not happen in your family. I said it will not happen in your family. That kind of cruelty, that kind of brutality, 
that kind of animal nature in a person that proclaims I'm born again. Uh -uh, that's not being born again. When we're born again, our lives are changed. When we're born again, our lives are transformed. And we're not keeping people as slaves anymore. In that family, you're declaring you're a man, you're a woman, you're a boy, you're a girl, you're a parent, you're a child. You're saying, I came into this family not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me in the church. You're in the church. Not to do your own will. That anything that occurs to you anytime, you're free to do not at all. You come into the church that you got born again, you got redeemed, or you got sanctified, and then he places you here, not to do your will, but to do the will of him that sent you. I pray that that same mind of Christ, that heart of Christ, that experience of grace will be in every life in Jesus' name. John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 28. John chapter 8, verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. Can you think about that? I do nothing of myself. I say nothing of myself. I go nowhere of myself. I act in no way to be of myself, independent from the Lord. Can you say what Christ has said? That's what made the Father pleased with him. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father has not led me alone. Listen to this, for I do, tell me the next word, for I do, tell me out loud, for I do personalize that, for I do always those things, tell me, to please him. That's what the Lord wants of you, of me, of us, of everyone that claims to be a child of God. Of the man and of the woman, of the brother and of the sister, of the workers and of the leaders, of the women and of the men. It tells us in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 49. The blessed gospel model of blessing the Lord. Chapter 12 and verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself. You know, in our families, that's what brings problem. The man doesn't think, what oh, I'm going to tell my wife now. Does that please the Lord? The way I say to my wife, does that please the Lord? My action, my reaction to my wife, does that please the Lord? My action, my reaction to my husband, does that please the Lord? And the way we spend money and the things we say about money, and the way is uh, one-sided, does that please the Lord? We must check up all those things so that the Lord will say every time that everything we do, money, business, family, uh, relations out there, anywhere and everywhere, we're acting in such a way as to please the Lord. I pray your life will please the Lord your life in particular, your life in particular, in the family, in the church, it will please the Lord in Jesus' name. I hear some amen, some people are keeping quiet. Verse 49, for I have not spoken of myself. Preacher, 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 I have not spoken of myself. I will need to learn that what he puts in our mouth, that we say, whether they hear, whether they forbear, that everything he wants us to say, all the doctrine he wants us to teach, that we teach, for I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Look at this, I know and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. It will be so in our church. The Lord Jesus Christ has left us an example. As well as the grace, he saves, so we can be like him. He sanctifies, so we can be like him. He conforms us to his will so that we can please him as he pleads, we can please the Father, as he pleased the Father, he baptizes us to empower us in the Holy Ghost to please the Lord in all things, under all conditions, and at all times. And the Lord has called upon us to leave every other sinner and to look unto him, unto Christ who saved us 
unto Christ who has sanctified us and unto Christ who has baptized us in the Holy Ghost unto Christ who has called us. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore seen, ye also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside. Let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight. You look at your life. You say, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I know the time was sanctified. I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I know the time he filled me with the Holy Ghost. Why is it I'm having difficulty getting out of this pattern of life? Why am I not in this pattern of life that is absolutely perfectly pleasing the Lord at all times? Search your life. Look at your life and look at the weight and look at that weight and lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2 Looking unto Jesus. Say that. Looking unto Jesus. Help me say that. Say that again. You know how many times now human frailty we're looking at David and secretly in our hearts we're saying if David did that and went away with that what's the conclusion? Don't you do like David? David is your savior. David is your model. The Old Testament man that brought calamity over his family that's for example we're going to look unto Jesus. And you know, sometimes uh, the men talking to men, how they deal with their wives, how they handle their wives, how we control the money in the family, how we control the lifestyle of everything, everybody there, how we're like, you know, captains and soldiers over the barracks in a little family. And then they give that to you. And then uh, you're looking onto them. Is that your example? Tell me now. I'm going to ask the men to stand up if you don't answer me. I said, is that your example? Oh. Who's my example? Yeah. Who's your example? Yeah. Gentle and lowly, compassionate and considerate, loving. Even when going to the cross, the love of God and the love of the disciples, that love was still there. It will be in our hearts, husbands, in Jesus' name. And wives, don't mind what you know anybody has done. Do your duty. God will help you. I can't hear my sisters. Those boys are wonderful. God bless your families. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the, of the throne of God. You will reign with Christ finally in Jesus' name. Point number three, the believer's gracious ministry that pleases the Lord. The believer's gracious ministry that pleases the Lord. He has called us to a life of pleasing him. But you look away from every bad example and were to please the Lord, you will please the Lord this year. Everything, every day before you do anything, you ask, does this please the Lord? Before you go anywhere, does this please the Lord? Before you speak to your subordinates, people you think are under you, actually they are not under you. It may just be in service and ministry, and God has placed some to be here and some to be behind. But we have the same life of Christ. And those are subordinates in office and ministry, you'll ask yourself before you say anything to them, does this please the Lord? Will do the things that are pleasing to the Lord in Jesus' name. In Micah chapter 6, verse 7. Micah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What's he looking for? What's he asking for? What will please him? Verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, 
and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what pleases him. And we're going to do that which pleases him in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter, chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What do you do? How do you do it? And what you do, is it to please yourself or to please God? Is it to please a man or to please God? Is it to please a woman or to please God? Is it to please a boss or to please God? For if I yet please men, I shall not be the servants of Christ. Verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I confide not of flesh and blood. I pray God will help every one of us that when we're called to do whatever a mind will be to please the Lord, you will please the Lord at all times in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. But as we have been, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. You know what the apostle is saying here? He says, "What well, the servants of the Lord has called us. And then we're put in trust with the gospel. And when we preach, when we minister, when we counsel, it is not to please men, but to please God who tries our hearts. So then, if your mind is diverted from the Lord, while you are ministering, any kind of ministry, and it is to please men so they will not persecute you, please women so they will speak well of you, please families so they will talk nice of you, and then you abandon God, you forsake God, you forget God, and you forget that the one who is going to judge you on the final day is the Lord himself. Or it is to please a particular person who has done wrong and has been reported to you. And then you feel you know, to please him so you can see have a good working relationship. Then you are not serving the look at that verse again. It says, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust for the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. What the result of that pleasing the Lord in verse 10? Here are witnesses. And God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. The Lord, the Lord is pleased with what and how? Is pleased with repentance and restitution. When we forget position, we forget human comment, we forget human whatever. I will say, I know what God wants me to repent. And you repent and you make restitution. That pleases the Lord. Faith and faithfulness also please the Lord. You have faith in the Lord? Because without faith, you cannot please Him. He that comes to God, comes to God for salvation, must believe. He that comes to God, he comes to God for the grace of holiness. He must believe. He that comes to God and it comes to God for sanctification and for living a life, a life above reproach, a life above sin. That faith pleases the Lord. Faith and faithfulness pleases the Lord. Forgiveness and fellowship that pleases the Lord. And forgiveness, you receive forgiveness from the Lord and then you give forgiveness to everybody around you. Your wife, you forgive. Your husband, you forgive. Your children, your parents, you forgive. The members of the church, you forgive. And the pastors uh, over the churches, you forgive. And there's forgiveness and fellowship. And in your place of work in your community, there is forgiveness. There's no revenge. There's no retaliation. There's no paying them back in their, in their coin. There's no sending it back to the sender. There's forgiveness and fellowship that pleases the Lord. Repentance and restitution. 
that pleases the Lord. Faith and faithfulness, that pleases the Lord. Forgiveness and fellowship, that pleases the Lord. Holiness and humility. You know, when we're humble, when you're not proud of who I am, I'm going to do whatever I please. I'm going to act whichever way I want. When you're not like that, when there's humility and holiness, that pleases the Lord. When there's love and loyalty, you are loyal to the Lord who has called you. And you are loving in the fellowship that pleases the Lord. Truth and truthfulness. God is not pleased when truth is falling. Falling in the street or falling in the church. But when there's truth and truthfulness, it pleases the Lord. Obedience and divine ownership. When you understand, God owns me. He owns my life. He owns my spirit. He owns my property. He owns my days. He owns me through and through. When you understand that and you act accordingly in obedience to the Lord that pleases the Lord. When you act, you understand consecration and commitment. I belong to him. I give everything to him. My time, I give. My skill, I give. My ability, I give. My days, I give. My commitment, I give. That kind of consecration, commitment pleases the Lord. Purity and perseverance. You're pure. There's temptation. You remain pure. Trial. You remain pure. Opposition. You remain pure. Insinuations. You remain pure. Whatever comes, you're persevering in a purity that pleases the Lord. Sanctification and absolute surrender. That's what pleases the Lord when your heart is circumcised, when you're purified, and you're single-minded. And you surrender to the Lord and your selfless oneness and unity pleases the Lord. Oneness and unity pleases the Lord. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we're reading from verse 5. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 5. It says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And it was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that, tell me, say it loud, that he pleased God. And now he comes to us, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I pray will please the Lord in Jesus' name. I said, you will please the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we we'll receive of him. He will answer your prayer. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Look at the promises of God. Examine and check the promises of God. Because this year is the year of your fulfillment. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. But look at the condition. Because, because, because we keep his commandments. And tell me. And tell me out loud. Do those things that are pleasing in his sight. All the grace of God will be available for you. The strength of the Almighty will be available for you. And the joy of pleasing the Lord and serving the Lord will be yours in Jesus' name. You will please the Lord. Great will be your joy. Great will be answers to your prayers. And great will be the provision of the Lord for your life in Jesus' name. As we go about this here, understand, He loves you. And you love Him too. And you are doing the things and saying the things and acting and living in ways that please Him. And you can be assured every prayer you pray today and beyond will be answered in Jesus name you'll be a beloved child of God because whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer say Lord we well, thank you Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. We'll please you this year 
every moment, every day, in every situation. Grant us the grace, He will. Grant us the strength, He will. Grant us the ability, He will, to please you. And then your blessings will be abundant upon our lives. Why the beginner pray? You heard the message? Pleasing the Lord. Surrender yourself unto the Lord. You're not of your own, but you're of God. In everything that you do, in all manner of conversation, in all action, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, that from today, you will, from today you will look unto him only. You will not say, he did this, that is why I do it. He backslid that is why I will backslide. He committed sin, so I will commit sin. He did it. No, you will look unto Jesus only. And everything, Him only. You will not obey the society and, and disobey God. You will not lead to pay pressure and, and disobey God. Moses, Moses listened to the pressure of his followers and he hit the rock twice. What was the re what was the repercussion? His followers they went into the promised land. Why Moses was disqualified from yielding to their pressure because he refused to follow God's will. Pray as a leader, as a member, as a follower of of, of Christ, that you fulfill His will at all time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We give you all the praise for what you've done for us from the beginning to the end of oh God. You fed us with your word. We pray, Lord, that this word, oh God, we fall into the fertile ground of our heart. That this word we grow and bear fruit in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, from today, oh God, we've heard the word of God fully. Father, we ask. That the impact of this world will be seen in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we will not just only have a head knowledge of your word, but a practical knowledge of faith. Amen. That we will carry out your word. Because you said it is the doer of the world that will be justified. Help us to be the doer of your word. Help us, O oh God, Father, as we go out there, O oh Lord, that we will be, O oh God, an embodiment of your glory. That we will be a good example to those out there in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, the truth we've heard, oh God. As we go out, oh God, in our walking place on the street, oh God, we will not throw it away. It's not fought to, to the street. But rather, we will use it mightily to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, we've prayed. Amen. Let's share the grace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely. God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Say, say, say to your neighbor, you are not of yourself, but of God. You are not of yourself, but of God. You are not of yourself, but of God. Amen. You are not of yourself, but of God. Hallelujah.